Uh, he is the president and CEO of Rule Investment Media. You can find out more details at uh, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, have this gentleman finally on Small Cap Interviews with me, Jim Gordon. Rick Rule joins us. Rick, thanks for joining us. Jim, a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, great to have you, sir. Hey, um, I got to start out right off the bat. I said to you before we went on camera that um, one of the things my producer Raph loves is, is the shopping cart analogy, the metaphor of, for investors. And you look at investing like you're in a grocery store, uh, which I love. And, and it leads me to, you know, things are on sale, things are too high, what you do in a grocery store. Uh, and, I want to know what companies are, if we carry that metaphor further, what companies are on your shopping list? And if I were to look at your shopping cart at the express lane at the end of 2024, what would I see? Well, certainly the analogy is right. If people bought financial products the way they buy consumer goods, they'd do better. <laughs> when people here in Vancouver go for a winter's coat, they don't look at a store that says all prices premium, yeah. nothing ever cheap. They look for goods that are on sale. When people buy financial goods for some reason, they want things that are breaking out to new highs, which is to say people want to overpay. Right. My suspicion is that uh, price levels justify narrative oh, okay. uh, that. Yeah. around uh, equities. I don't know why that is, but the idea that you buy things that represent good value uh, as opposed to things that other people think are, are popular would seem to me to be a more rational way to invest. So if people bought uh, stocks the way they buy tuna fish yeah, or other yeah. household items, I think they'd have much better results. Um, a lot of different uh, mm -hmm. topics we want to talk about. Let's start with uranium. Uh, you accurately stated the uranium place was the place to be. Uh, where do you see that going in 2024? A complicated answer. Uh, I think the easy money has been made in uranium. Oh, okay. Uh, as a contrarian, I love hate when a sector is determinedly out of favor, when it has no bid, yeah. that's my place. That's when goods are on sale. Three years ago, the uranium price was at 20 bucks a pound. It cost the industry fully loaded, including, including cost of capital, about 60 bucks a pound to make it. So you make it for 60, you sell it for 20, 20. you lose 40 bucks a pound, you try and make it up on volume, being a miner. It right. doesn't work. Right. At the same time that the industry was functionally in liquidation, the reality was that uranium, even in a country like the United States, which believed it could afford to do without it, constituted 20% of baseload power. If the price didn't go out, the light, if the price didn't go up, pardon me, the lights would go out. Right. And the question was, which do you think was more likely? I believed it was more likely that the price would go up. Now that it's happened, now that uranium's no longer cheap, everybody wants to buy it. It's right. perverse. I believe that the structure of the uranium market, for reasons that we don't have time to talk about here, is conducive to very reasonable returns on capital employed for the sector going forward. That's different. The easy money has been made. Okay. The bellwether stock has gone from what, $8 to $42, $43, which is to say even the big stock is up 500%. Right. A basket of the viable juniors is probably up 400% in three years. The easy money has been made. So I've taken my capital out of the sector. I continue to have money in the stocks, but I have a free ride. I've paid for them with sales. Right. Interesting. Let's uh, jumping to oil and gas thoughts for 2024. I love the oil business. Uh, I, I think the oil stocks provide reasonable rates of return for a very long time. Again, precisely because they're unimportant. Mm -hmm. The big thinkers that you look at, the that noted energy physicist, what's her name, Greta Thornburg, uh, <laughs> President Biden, <laughs> Prime Minister Trudeau, would have you believe that the end of oil, uh, end of oil demand is about 2030. Let me leave you an interesting statistic. Alternative energies, which is their panacea, and by the way, I'm not opposed to them. Mm -hmm. We've spent five trillion dollars now, over 40 years on alternative energy. We've reduced the market share of fossil fuels from a high of 82% all the way down to 81% mm -hmm. with a five trillion dollar investment. Yeah. Peak oil demand probably occurs 2065 to 2070. Meanwhile, because oil and gas are politically incorrect, the oil and gas companies are under-investing in sustaining capital to the tune of about a billion dollars a day. This doesn't have an impact for three months or four months or six months, but it has an impact in 24 months or 30 months. Right. So higher oil prices are with us for longer, absent fairly immediate peace in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I, staying with that though, when you were talking about those, those individuals, if you're investing though, you, you must see that's just virtual signaling and grandstanding for the, for the most part, right? You can't say to, to 2030, that's... that's yeah. uh, it's difficult 
for me to understand that level of stupidity. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's malevolence. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, uh, I don't pay too much attention to the cause of it. I just take a look at the effect. Yeah. I look at the energy center banks, where the banks that have dominated energy lending for years, Citicorp as an example, or Royal Bank of Canada, pulling back out of their single best lending business, energy, right. because it's politically unpalatable. And I say, this is true economic madness. Yeah. And it's my job as a speculator to step into the void. Yeah, no, I hear you. Um, I wanted to talk to you about your, your fireside chat with Robert Friedland and, and right. talk about another commodity, and that is the copper. Um, and, and the growing massive demand for this? Uh, I, I, that's one story. Uh, the demand story that's probably popular among small cap commentators are things like electric vehicles and the yeah. electrification of the West. Okay. The real story is that there's a billion people on Earth with no access to primary electricity. Two billion more people on Earth with access to only intermediate Right. Uh, or unaffordable electricity. If you remember back to the decade of the 2000s, the real story was the urbanization of China. Mm -hmm. And that urbanization is taking place around the world, which is a wonderful thing. Right. We've done a great job as a species of raising the living standards of the poorest of the poor for 40 years, which is a great thing. That continues. They want to live like you live. They want to live like I live. And right. that requires copper. Right. Not merely to get the electricity to them, but then to wire their house to utilize it. Right. To upgrade their method of transportation from a bicycle to a 50cc motorcycle. Incredible, incredible amounts of copper utilization. Right. In a world where spending on exploration and spending on development is declining, we need to replace the biggest copper mine in the U.S., Bingham Canyon, every year for the next 10 years to meet current demand, assuming a demand doesn't grow. Right. We aren't discovering a Bingham Canyon a year. Why, why is it We aren't declining? building a Bingham Canyon a year. Why is the, the, the mining for copper uh, We have underinvested in copper mining for 30 years, uh, partially because 30 years ago we had too much copper. Right. There was no reason to explore for something that you didn't have right. a need for. However, it, it's a very, very, very long-term process. I'll give you an example. Uh, about 30 years ago, a wonderful discovery was made in Arizona called Resolution. Okay. One and a half percent copper, average mine grade worldwide, one half of percent. So three times the average grade, and a big deposit too, billion and a half tons. The deposit was made, discovery was made 30 years ago. It's been 25 years in permitting. Uh, it looks like it'll be five to seven more years in permitting before mine construction starts. So from discovery to first copper, probably 40 years. Wow. So if you assumed that we went out and spent a bunch of money looking for copper right now, which we're not doing, uh, and you assume that the copper price went up to an incentive price to find more copper, for a while, like a decade, it wouldn't matter. Yeah. Because we don't have the projects to fill the pipeline. Um, one of the other things I wanted to discuss is emerging markets going into challenging political environments. We just talked about the example you gave, which I'm assuming is a gross e example of uh, bureaucracy and regulation. Uh, what is the flip side then going to say someplace where politically it may be unstable, but, but there is, uh, there's great uh, desire to get into that environment? Sadly, Jim, there's political risk everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. The, the good jurisdictions do not exist. Uh, the jurisdiction I just told you with a 25-year right. delay yeah. is the United States, yeah. allegedly a good jurisdiction. The example that's come to everybody's mind recently has been Panama and their nationalization of a mine that had $8 billion spent on it mm -hmm. with uh, a contract with the government ratified and subject, by the way, to international arbitration. The Panamanians in their wisdom have now stepped into a circumstance where they're certain to lose an international court yeah. and they'll be subjected to an eight billion dollar judgment, eight billion dollars that they don't have. But of course it gets worse. The mine was responsible for about 25% of the company's export earnings and 6% of GDP. Mm -hmm. This is a classic example of stealing defeat from right. the jaws yeah, of victory. victory. And unfortunately this tend towards, this ten tre tendency towards make-believe mm -hmm. in politics is continuing rather than in decreasing on a global basis. So increasingly Investors are going to have to be cognizant of pol political risk, but they're going to have to be cognizant of their own bias around political risk, too. Right. British Columbia, risky. The United States, risky. Panama, Bolivia, perhaps more risky. Yeah. What I've learned as an investor is if you weren't prepared to tolerate political risk, you belong in another business. 
I personally would rather take technical risk, yeah. or pardon me, political risk, than I would technical really? risk. In other words, I would prefer a great deposit in a bad country over a bad deposit in a good country. Right. Because I believe from a political point of view with regards to mining, all countries are bad. And, and I guess the example you gave of, as I mentioned, the bureaucracy and the regulation in America with that 25 year wait. Uh, uh, I guess you sit down, you're the expert, and you, you weigh the difference between that, knowing that, uh, okay, I know it's coming, I know it's coming, this is going to take years, compared to, I don't know what could be happening in Panama a right. year from now. I think that's right. I think that people are uh, more comfortable with political risk in societies that they're familiar with. Yeah, okay. And, and I have to say, and I'll say it on film, I think part of it's racial. I think people like you and I are more comfortable with theft that occurs from white people in English, yeah. according to the rule of law, than they are more traditional forms of theft. The truth is the money's just as gone. Yeah. Ironically, and I'm not suggesting that people at home do this, I've been treated better as an investor in a democratic republic than I was in my home state, the People's Republic of California. Wow. Uh, I'm not trying to say that I wasn't exposed to little risks, Ebola, mm -hmm. civil war, malaria yeah, yeah. <laughs> in Congo. What I'm trying to say is that countries that absolutely positively need mining are occasionally more tolerant than countries that believe that they can afford to do without it. But all countries are bad. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I'd like to just circle back um, about getting advice for, for investors. Uh, one of the, the threads that I've discussed with people like yourself throughout this day is, is getting them to talk to that first time investor or that young couple that is wanting to dip their toe uh, in the waters. What, what, what's some basic comment? Go back to that grocery store metaphor that you kick things off with. Uh, can I give book recommendations? You certainly can, sir, absolutely. Four. Okay. Economics in One Lesson by Hazlitt teaches you how the economy really works, okay. not the way you were taught in university, which is fiction. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, the Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham, a guy who taught Warren Buffett how to invest. Okay. Okay. Easiest investment book to read relative to the lessons it teaches. If you enjoyed The Intelligent Investor, read Securities Analysis. Simply the best investment book ever written, but not easy to read. Okay. Finally, for me, the most impactful book I ever read uh, with regards to uh, human volition, human action, a book called Human Action by Ludwig von Mises, okay. talking about what motivates people in, either individually or as groups. Those four books, if people read them and employ the lessons, they will get rich as investors. Not they might. They if will. they read those four books and they employ the lessons contained in those books, they will, as opposed to might, get rich. Don't just get the book. Read the book and consciously employ the lessons. If you do that, you will succeed as an investor. Don't listen to too much popular media. Yeah. Don't listen to somebody who makes a commission selling you things until you have prepared yourself, until you've invested in yourself and learned how to be a better investor. Yeah, that's sound advice. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I want to mention one last thing too. We, we want to talk about uh, our viewers can get into something of stock rating. You wanted to mention yeah. that before we go uh, on? Any of your listeners, and I, uh, I know Small Caps has thousands of them, who care about natural resources and care about my opinion can personalize it. If you go to my website, ruralinvestmentmedia.com, and you list your natural resource st stock portfolio, you list your stocks there, I personally, on a no obligation, no cost basis, will rank them one to 10. One being best, 10 being worst. And I'll comment on individual issues if I think my comments might have value. Rural investment media, please no crypto, please no tech stocks, please no pot stocks. Leave an old guy to do what he does well. <laughs> you do, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, Rick Rule joins us here on Small Cap Interviews. All our interviews available on smallcapinterviews.com. Uh, Thank you very much for watching. I'm Jim Gordon.